Operating at the cutting edge of advanced materials and manufacturing, Amero utilizes leading technology to produce refractory metals and specialty powders for critical applications. The company's work is building upon the resurgence in American manufacturing, providing critical and strategic industrial capability. In this interview, we will talk to Amero CEO, Hank Holland, about his early life and career experiences. This will be followed by Hank recounting how a trip to Ukraine soon after Russia's invasion led to his investment in Amero. My name is Greer Howard, and this is A Moment With. Well, Hank, we are here outside of the Amero building. So what can you tell us about this building where we are today? Yeah, first, thanks, Greer, for being here. Really appreciate it. So what you're seeing is uh, Amero's new manufacturing and corporate headquarter facility. We're outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee, in the midst of a 300-acre industrial park. What we're looking at right now are the, what will be five argon tanks uh, that are instrumental to our manufacturing process that we'll see inside. The 100,000-square-foot facility is essentially the centerpiece to what is our very ambitious plans to become the largest and the most agile producer of refractory and specialty alloys powders that are used in additive manufacturing or 3D printing for defense, space, and aerospace applications. All right, well, can we head on inside, get a little tour? Absolutely, please. All right, let's go. Well, Hank, let's go back a little bit, and why don't you talk a little bit about your upbringing and maybe when you first started working? Great. So I'm a seventh generation Texan, grew up in a middle class family and absolutely identify with middle class, middle America values. I fell in love with work early. I had my first job when I was 14 years old. I was a bus boy at a family owned Mexican food restaurant in Dallas where I grew up. And you know, you've been working, like you said, since you were 14. By the time you were in college, you were financially independent. There had to have been some values that were instilled in you. What values would you say that those were? In my freshman year, I began working, not full time, but pretty close. I was working 30 hours a week while in engineering school. And it was out of necessity. My family had had a financial reversal and I found myself at 18 years old, no choice but to support myself. And when you have no money, failure is not an option. Right. You just have to do it. You have to figure it out, right? And I think in many ways, I've carried that through my career. All right, and over here, it looks like these are the plans. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll finish here before right we transition. Here. <laughs> but again, here you're looking at the 100,000 square foot building that we've been walking through. We're gonna end up in the large first production atomizer area. We walked all of this that you're looking at today essentially will be done in about 90 days. And then we'll move on to build out the offices and so forth that we'll finish late this calendar year or early next year. Well, I have loved the tour, but I have more to talk to you about. So you ready to uh, sit down Absolutely. and continue our conversation? Please. thank you. All right. Well, today we did a tour of this incredible facility, but the story of Amero for you really starts back in 2022. You took a trip to Ukraine and Poland after it was invaded by Russia. And that's kind of where everything started to change. So can you kind of take me back and tell me a little bit about that story? Yeah, and maybe even a bit of context before that. Uh, Pegasus, typical of its approach as I describe, of looking at these high conviction, big thematic investments. In the early days of COVID, we acquired controlling interest of a business called Logic Source from Bain Capital Ventures. And less than two years later, we sold that business for 11 times our investment. And as I was waiting for that investment to close, so we made the investment in March of 2020, early days of COVID, we're now in March of 2022. You and I would turn on the evening news and see the dreadful events unfolding in Ukraine. And as a father, and at this time with adult children, I, I was just torn by seeing these images of women and children on these train platforms seeking safety, being separated from their family, their husbands who all had been left behind to fight the war, if you will. And it inspired me to, to act. And thus I went over to Ukraine and, and Poland, as you described. I got over there and the very first thing I did was I went to a local store and, and bought them out of these homemade teddy bears. Mm. And I've got a wonderful po photo of myself in a camouflage backpack stuffed with these bears. And I went to the train platform in Warsaw and began giving out these bears to these kids coming off the trains. And that was the beginning of Project Apollo, right? That led to Project Apollo, which, um, you know, you have no idea we do these things in life. You don't know where it's going to lead us, right? And 
And so after a couple of days of uh, volunteering in Warsaw, uh, I got networked with some former British SAS commandos, uh, amazing, amazing men. And we stood up Project Apollo. And the real mission of Project Apollo was to extract uh, women and children that were in very vulnerable situations, in many cases behind enemy lines in Donbass and Donetsk and other places. I happened to be in Lviv the night, uh, Ukraine, the night the first Russian cruise missile came in and blew up a fuel depot in very close proximity to us. And uh, that night I had this thought that all I've known in my adult life is globalization, particularly in the business world. And on the heels of COVID and with the vulnerabilities we saw with the supply chain, the challenges that we had, and now with this Ukraine conflict, it became very apparent to me that globalization was over and that I will spend the rest of my career in adult life winding the clock backwards. And not unlike the early days of World War II, when we had to stand up and create, essentially, industrial scale capabilities in this country, we will set out again doing the same thing. Uh, and we've got enormous vulnerabilities. And that was really the epiphany of what came from this trip to Ukraine. So it sounds like that trip really changed you. Would you say that it also kind of changed the trajectory of what you were looking for in business and in your investments? Yeah, it changed me from the standpoint of, you know, I think life, we evolve, right? We, we it, it, at least in my case, very few of these things have been intentional. One thing leads to another, call it fate, call it whatever you say. But in this case, I did come home, as you suggested, very intentionally looking for a business that we could buy that was an advanced manufacturing or advanced materials business that could be part of the solution as we reestablish these industrial-based capabilities in the U.S. And so how did Amero come about and how did you know that that was the business you were looking for? So we've historically invested in private businesses, not public companies, and Amero is a listed company on the Australian Stock Exchange. We came back, we looked at about a dozen businesses, one of which happened to be Amero. Amero was the only public business. All the other businesses were US-based businesses, private businesses, which is historically where we had invested. What intrigued me about Amero was, Amero was at the forefront of the adoption of metal 3D printing. So this advanced technology that's being adopted and was just at that inflection point of adoption, if you will, coupled with some very, very interesting intellectual property and know-how that had come out of Monash University. And so that was the early premise, if you will, of the investment in Amero. So that's sort of where it started with Amero, but so much has changed in just a short amount of time that you've been there. And traditionally, you were just investing in some of these businesses, but with Amero, you actually have become CEO and executive chairman. So kind of talk to me about what you know, led you to that. It wasn't the plan. <laughs> Right? The plan was to be an actively engaged board member, an active investor in this business as we had others. Um, and once we made this investment, which was May of 2022, it was a few months later that I received government approval to join the board as a foreigner. Uh, and upon joining the board, quickly determined that unfortunately we did not feel the strategy was viable. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we simply got some things wrong. I mean, it's, it's that simple. And, and so the choice that I then had at that time was to quit to chalk it up as a mistake and to move on, or to essentially double down and invest more capital and get more actively involved. And to a fault, I'm not a very good quitter. You mentioned that earlier when we were walking around that even from a very young age that you just worked and you weren't a quitter. And so that has continued to stay with you, obviously. So what were uh, maybe a few of those changes now that you're you know, CEO, what are a couple of those changes that you've made? So I think of, of, of most consequence are really three strategic decisions that we made. And by the way, an amazing board that I work alongside of. The three decisions really were first and foremost, the end market, the opportunity was the US. So this company was based uh, in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Australia is an incredible ally, an incredible country. Uh, and this business was spawned out of Australia. But again, we all know the size of our economy and from an industrial base standpoint, and particularly from a defense sector standpoint, right, the U.S. is the crux. And so relocating this business to the U.S. and specifically to Tennessee where we sit now was the most important strategic decision, number one. That then enabled us to attract a technical and operating team I could not have attracted in Australia. And I think we truly have the most world-class, the most experienced and proven operating team that we've stood up. 
being in Tennessee, having the operating team, the connectivity we have, that then led us to understand an opportunity which wasn't even clear to us before we made the investment. What became known to us once we moved to, to uh, Tennessee though was there was an incredible need and a, a dearth of U.S. domestic supply for specialty alloy powders, refractory powders that are used in advanced defense and space applications. So that was the other strategic change, was prioritize the production of these specialty alloy powders. So by making these important strategic changes, how does that affect potentially the future of Amero? Well, there too, I think if you look at it in the context of where we are as a country, right, as a country from a national security perspective and from economic security perspective. We've got amazing vulnerabilities. There's a capability that is fundamental that we're missing, right? And it comes from this decades of outsourcing. What began with textiles, what began with things that are of less value, ended up with us exporting technology, capital equipment, basic capabilities, forging, something we won't spend a lot of talking about. Before the Ukraine conflict, Boeing, the most important capital equipment company in the world, outsourced almost all of its forging capability to a company called VSMPO in Russia, right? It's not going to work. <laughs> not going to work, right? And much the same when you look at the other industrial-based capabilities that are primary to us standing up both defense capabilities and then new innovative economies and new innovative industries such as space. And that's really the thrust of what Amero is. Well, it's really cool to see not only your belief in the investment, but your belief in, in what you're doing, which is, which, is really, which is really special. So talk a little bit maybe about your leadership style and the culture that you're creating at Amero. So I think from a leadership style standpoint, it goes back to what we talked about earlier in the presentation. You know, I, my roots, right, are middle America. My roots are middle class. And my roots are work really, really, really hard and hope you get lucky. We've attracted a group of people that, that understand the sense of urgency of which we must act. And as a small business, we can act with a sense of urgency the way a big business can't. And what comes with that is a recognition, acceptance, we're gonna make mistakes. And I'm not afraid of making mistakes. And the team's not afraid of making mistakes. But we collectively will then quickly course correct and iterate and move on. And I think that's what underscores the culture, is a, a shared vision of where we're going and a sense of urgency to get there. Well, there is obviously a lot ahead for Amero. So where do you envision Amero being within the next year, or maybe five years? So maybe first talk about where I hope our country will be in the next year and next five years. Uh, there's a wonderful book I would recommend anyone called The Arsenal of Democracy. And The Arsenal of Democracy talks about the early days of World War II and where we were as a country from an industrial base standpoint. In the early days of World War II, we had no capability to build planes. Germany and the UK were the only ones with capability to build planes. By the end of the war, we were building one bomber an hour. One bomber an hour, largely out of the automobile industry led by Ford and other companies that we refit to address these industrial needs. I don't think it's hyperbole that we're back there again today. And I think one of the very few things in this country that have had bipartisan support is recognizing this and supporting this through federal policy. So whether it was the Inflation Reduction Act, whether it's the CHIP Act, whether it's executive orders, congressional appropriations, whatever the case may be, there's a rallying cry today. We must establish these industrial-based capabilities from a national security and from an economic security standpoint. So back to your question, where do I hope Amero will be? I hope we'll look back in three to five years and in a small way see that we are part of that solution that we are part of establishing and reestablishing these critical capabilities and create a more resilient supply chain and thus reducing the threats that we have to our country so that my kids and your kids grow up in a prosperous and secure country. Well, Hank, thanks so much for being here with me today. And I really enjoyed our tour and getting to talk to you. And I look forward to following to see what Amero does in the future. Thank you, Greer.